scripture reading for this morning comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 34. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights in giving you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. Make for yourselves wallets that don't wear out, a treasure in heaven that never runs out. No thief comes near there, and no moth destroys. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be too. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we wrap up our series, Ah, This Is Not the Life. And we've been looking at things that stand in the way of us living the life, the kind of life that God has for us and wants for us, the kind of life that is fulfilling, one of joy and purpose and connection. And we've looked at three things that stand in the way. And uh, if we were to sum each of them up in just one word, and the word from the scripture, those words would be hypocrisy, greed, and worry. Those are the literal words that Jesus used. He said, watch out for hypocrisy, guard against greed. And then last week he said, don't worry. And then he started teaching and realized we were already worrying. So he said, just stop it. Stop worrying. But for me, what has made this series impactful and kind of more relatable for me is that Jesus took us beyond just those words and the stereotypical definition of those words. Because I don't know about you, I don't really want to come to a place where I have to confront whether or not I'm a hypocrite. Right? Is it comfortable saying, like, oh, today I'm going to dive deep into whether I'm a hypocrite? Because the truth is I am, I probably am, but I don't want to think about it. I don't want to own up to it. I want something that I can maybe be a little bit more comfortable exploring. And thankfully, Jesus did that for us. Now, he did start in the first week with the stereotypical understanding of hypocrisy because he began by talking about the religious professionals who just a chapter before had begun to plot against him. And so he was pointing to them as an example of hypocrisy. On the outside, they looked like these holy people, these righteous people, these people that knew God and were waiting faithfully for the Messiah. And well, guess what? The Messiah has shown up and they've decided to do what? Plot against him, right? They are working to stop his movement. They have not recognized the one person they have been waiting for their entire life and arguably the entire life of humanity. That's a, that's a problem, right? You look good on the outside, not so good on the inside. That's the traditional understanding of hypocrisy, but he made sure that he didn't leave it there. I know, it's frustrating. <laughs> Jesus tends to push us beyond what we are comfortable with and likes to push a little bit. He said, you, you might think that, that they're the hypocrites, but let's just see how you feel about this. Jesus taught them that it can actually work in reverse, right? They looked holy on the outside, but had some issues going on on the inside. But he pushed his disciples to see, you can also have faith on the inside and the love of Christ on the inside and a dedication to the mission of the church on the inside. But then if you don't express that Outwardly, in any way, that too is a disconnect between the inside and the outside, right? And we talked about that on Back to School Weekend, which I can't believe was just four weeks ago. As we're getting back into the swing of things, as we're coming out of the summer and into the routine, what routine are we getting back to? Is it one that reflects our priorities? That we are people of God, people of faith, that we're not going to overschedule ourselves, that we're going to do what God has called us to do? Or do we put ourselves right back in the rat race, right back on that hamster wheel where we're running ourselves ragged and we're doing what other people are telling us to do? And of course, too, for Jesus' disciples in, in the specific situation he was speaking into, it wasn't just that the disciples maybe didn't want to live out their faith. I mean, they were. They were following Jesus. They had left everything. But they were starting to have second thoughts because... The religious professionals were plotting against them. Like, if you were the 12 disciples of public enemy number one, that makes you public enemy number two through 13, right? It suddenly was being kind of dangerous for them to follow Jesus. And Jesus wanted to encourage them to stick with their faith. And for us, we might not have, have fear for our physical lives when it comes to our faith, although there are believers around the world who do face that fear. We might be worried about other consequences. There might be social consequences or vocational consequences. There may be things we'd love to participate or love to have our kids participate in. But in order to be true to our faith, it makes it harder, if not impossible. But Jesus' encouragement to them was when you choose to be who God made you to be, and you choose to do what God has called you to do, even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it costs you something, God will provide. God will provide. 
Then in week two, someone from the crowd interrupted. He had a question. Jesus, my brother is not splitting the inheritance with me. Will you make him? And uh, Jesus refused. Now, Jesus didn't refuse because he doesn't care about fairness. There were even biblical laws about how inheritances were to be split up. And this brother didn't seem to be following them. It's not that Jesus didn't care about the biblical laws. He cared deeply about the biblical laws. But when Jesus looked at the situation, what he diagnosed was, this guy has a bigger problem than not inheriting money and land and sheep and goats. His problem is his relationship. If his brother doesn't want to split the inheritance with him, and he's running to a third party to make his brother split it, then they don't have a healthy relationship. And that's a bigger problem in Jesus' eyes. And he did go on to warn about greed, but why? It was because it was the greed that was pushing this brother further away from his other brother. It was also a sign that he was defining his life by possessions. He's lacking the money as a broken relationship. Which one does he think is going to make his life better? Which one does he try to solve first? The money one. And so the, then Jesus told a parable, which is a Bible word for a story. He told a parable about a man who was already rich and then received a blessing even bigger than that. His fields produced in abundance so that he didn't even have room in his barns to store it all. This guy is the financial opposite of his brother, of the brother. If the brother didn't have anything and wanted it, this guy had everything and didn't need anything else. And yet Jesus diagnosed in him the exact same problem. It's almost as if it doesn't matter if you have everything or nothing. That's not the measure of a good life. This man in the story was told, tonight you will die and who's going to get your stuff? And that should have been an easy answer. There should have been at least one person or one organization, or one neighbor, somebody should have been able to get that inheritance. But God implies that you don't have a relationship with anyone. Neither the abundance nor the lack of possessions defines the measure or quality of our life. And of course, we can substitute anything in there. You know, for some of us, it may be wealth, it may be possessions, or it may be the lack of wealth or possessions, but we can define the life in lots of ways how we use our time, what control we have over our time, our autonomy, our, our freedom, how much respect we get, how much authority we have, how much we achieve, how famous we are. There are a lot of measures we can use to define the value of our life, but the true measure, Jesus says, is being rich toward God, which also seems to have something to do with our relationships with one another, which is a good time to remember that when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus said there are actually two, and what were they? Love God and love others, one another, right? Loving God and loving one another, perhaps that's the measure of life. And then last week we touched on the topic of worry, and this one is a little bit more uh, socially acceptable. It's a little bit less uncomfortable. Maybe some of you have said, oh, I'm such a worrier, and other people might affirm to you, yes, you are, <laughs> or we just laugh it off, you know? It's, it's kind of socially acceptable to be a worrier, where if you, like, walked up to a friend and was like, I'm such a hypocrite, or I'm so greedy, they'd probably be like, that's too much for me. But we would also admit, I think, I hope, that a worrier is not a, an, an attractive quality in ourselves. It's not how we would design our own life. I hope my mom isn't saying about my daughter, oh, I hope she grows up to be a worrier just like her dad. You know, like we don't, we don't hope that people become worriers. Worrying is draining. It's limiting. It captures our focus and our energy and our resources. And Jesus gives us an iconic illustration calling us to look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field as examples of things in creation that don't worry. And our response is, Jesus, that's beautiful and poetic and all, but my life's a little bit more complicated than the birds and the flowers, right? If all I had to do was stand in a field for a day or two, I think I could handle that. If all I had to do was find a hole in a tree and grab a couple acorns every couple of days, I think I could handle that. But my life's a little bit more complex than that. And what if that's kind of Jesus' point? What if some of the worry we have is because we've allowed our lives to become so complex and so busy? Or it's okay to have a full schedule, but if we have a, a lack of organization or mission or defining values and priorities, maybe all of these things thrown together are just too much. And so I think part of what Jesus is doing is he's saying, yeah, I'm actually going to look at a really simple illustration so that we can get to the heart of what worry is all about. Let's strip away all the complexity and just talk for a minute. And so he points to the birds, the birds who cannot and were not made to plant, harvest, build barns, and store their own food. But even though they can't do that and weren't made to do that, what does God do for them? God provides, right? 
So the underlying wisdom is control what you can control and entrust the rest to God. And then he pointed to the flowers. He says they're here today and they're gone tomorrow and they don't spend their one day here on earth wearing themselves out with worry. But they stand tall reflecting the glory of God. And all of us in this room have had at least two days and hopefully all of us have at least two more, but our time is still limited. And so we still must wrestle with the question, what are we going to do with the time that we have? Are we going to spend it wearing ourselves out with worry? Or are we going to try to be and do what God made us for? And Jesus promises that if we desire the kingdom, then all of those other things that we worry about will be taken care of along the way. Now, Preaching 101 says, never do a recap. And I just did like a seven-minute recap. And I can see on your faces that I did a seven-minute recap. <laughs> but I broke this rule on purpose today. If you're going to break a rule, just break it on purpose. I broke this rule on purpose today because today's scripture is actually Jesus summing up these three topics. And these three topics were all in a row. They were part of one story, one passage, one interaction. I'm, I'm grateful that we took the time to break each of them down. You, one of the things that you probably don't ever see because you're not in my office and seeing my notes was this series was originally one message, and it was going to be like 45 minutes, which nobody wants. But breaking it down was good. It gave us a chance to dive in and play in each of those three ideas. But of course, Jesus is building something. And so I felt like, let's do a recap so that we're ready for the summary. So we can maybe see the things that tie it together. Because these weren't three disconnected stories. So as we look at these three topics, the mismatch of our heart and lives, defining life by the wrong measure, and straying outside of our area of control and calling, these are the obstacles to the life. Where are those obstacles located? Are they internal or are they external? Anyone want to guess? Are they internal or are they external? They're internal, right. And yet, on most days, if we think about what's holding us back from living the life we want to live, where do we tend to place the blame? Tend external, right? Man, my life would be so much easier if that person would get their stuff together. My life would be so much easier if work would just calm down. My life would be so much easier if I didn't have to drive my kid to 75 things this week. My life would be so much easier if we were less polarized. I would be so less worried if Putin would just end the war today. Like, there are things that we worry about, and we're always pointing. If that, would fi if that would fix itself, if that would work itself out, if this person would stop holding me back. But where does Jesus say the obstacles to living the life are? They're inside of us. Now, external things can absolutely turn these things into overdrive, can't they? Right? The economy, the, the price of gas, the war in Ukraine. Oh, there's lots of things. Your, your personal relationship with your neighbor who keeps you f keep fighting with. Like, there are lots of external things that can flare these up inside. But we have to recognize that the thing holding us back from living the life that God has called us to live is actually in our head, in our heart, in our spirit. It's internal. And just as... Um, the three problems have similarities. Jesus gives us three solutions along the way. Who provides the resolve to be who God called us to be? Who says, I'm going to provide for you even when it's hard? God. Who gets to define what life is? Who gets to define what the good life is? God, right? Who says, here's your area of control and everything else I'll take care of? Who says that? God does. So, are the solutions internal, or are they external? Kind of a trick question, right? External God, but we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, right? So it's a little bit of a trick question. You could answer either way and get credit. But the obstacle lies inside. The solution lies outside. But isn't that, too, the opposite of what we think or expect? When, when things are rough, things are hard, and we, I'm going to get a handle on my life this week. What, how do we try to fix it? By us taking control. By us using our own wisdom. By trying to use our own resources. It's maybe flip-flopped. We want to live a good life, but we end up using our own definitions, our own effort, our own perspective. When God says, trust me. Trust me. The thing that makes the life possible is looking to God for clarity and direction. 
And this is, this is ringing some bells for me, so let me see if I can get them ringing for you. When was the last time in the scripture that humanity was living the life, like fully and completely, not just for like a couple days at a time? When was humanity last living the life and everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be? The Garden of Eden, that's right, the first two pages of the Bible, right? Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. And I'll remind you that in that paradise, Adam and Eve still had responsibilities. They still had work to do. They still had areas of control that God told them, you are in charge of this. Don't drop the ball. Be fruitful and multiply. Make sure all creation is fruitful and multiply. Work and keep the garden. The life is not just retirement or vacations. But what ruins the life? Starts with S, ends with N. Sin. And what was that sin? They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is not just disobedience. This is not um, just breaking some arbitrary rule. It's not like God was like, hmm, let me see. I'll set up a test for him. Uh, yeah, I don't like that tree. Don't touch that tree. This was a very specific thing that God put off uh, out of bounds right? And why did God put that out of bounds, right? Who has been providing the knowledge of good and evil so far? God, right? All through Genesis chapter 1, God did this and saw that it was good. God did this and saw that it was good. God created this and saw that it was good. God created humanity and saw that everything was very good. And then in chapter 2, hey, here's your job. Here's your mission. That's good. Go do that. Oh, and by the way, don't touch that tree. That's bad. You see, God has been providing the knowledge of good and evil the whole time. God has been providing the blessings. God has been providing the boundaries. And then Adam and Eve thought, what if we got to decide that? What if, we decide, what if we could just cut the middleman out, the middleman being God? What if we could just cut God out and we'll take the knowledge for ourselves, and then we can make decisions on what's good and what's bad? Does that sound like anything we've just been talking about? We humanity have been at this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and yet it seems like we're still struggling with the first and most basic thing we were called to do, which is to trust God and to be who we were made to be and do what we were called to do. And then what did Adam and Eve do when they realized they messed up? They hid. Why? How'd they feel? They were afraid, right? They were afraid. You know, it's easy to stand up here and say, just confess your sin and ask God for forgiveness, and it'll be all right. But is it, is it ever really that? simple or comfortable it's it's simple but it's not comfortable you know when, when we're honest with ourselves you know maybe i should show up on sunday mornings saying i am a hypocrite and i would love for god to point it out to me this morning maybe i should walk in this room realizing that i am greedy and there are areas of my life that i am holding for myself and not being generous with or holding to myself and not trusting god with maybe i should walk in this room feeling that way it's not super comfortable for me but isn't that part of what this space and this room and this community and this opportunity is here for it's why we come to the table perhaps we have to look at ourselves with a, a level of clarity that we're not used to using is my inner and outer life really aligned when, my, when, it, when, it's, when it's hard and scary and uncomfortable and it might cost me something to stand up for what I believe in, am I willing to do it or do I just choose to stay silent? Am, how am I really defining the meaning of life? Or are there things that I'm chasing that I know I shouldn't? Do I really understand what's inside of my control and what's not? What does it look like to trust God with those things that are not in my control? It's scary to give up control, especially if you're a person who likes control and has control issues, isn't it? Of course, the funny thing is often giving up control to God is usually just admitting where we didn't have control, we just thought we did, but that's still scary. And on the flip side, if we give up control or we recognize we don't have control, then that's requiring us to trust that someone else has that control and will meet that need and will provide where we need provision. And I realize that this is Jesus telling us to do this, but sometimes I'm like, are Jesus the Son and God the Father on the same page? Or was God like, wait, you want me to do what now? You're adding what to my to-do list? Of course, they're unified in mission, but maybe the, more, the, the question we might struggle with more is less, is God willing to provide, but more, is God willing to provide for me? 
How many of you are able to say to virtually anyone else in your life, God loves you, but when you reach those moments of struggle, you wonder, but does God love me? You can tell that friend who's struggling, God will provide, just have faith, but when you're struggling, you end up trying to achieve it all. You see, it's so much harder to actually do this ourself. And so Jesus' summary of all of this begins, don't be afraid, little flock. Don't be afraid to live a life of alignment. Don't be afraid to trust God's definition of the life. Don't be afraid to live into your calling and entrust God with the rest. Don't be afraid to rely on God. And why not? Don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father delights in giving you the kingdom. Your Father delights in giving you the kingdom. The hardest part of parenting for me is not the discipline part when my little girl acts up and we've got to deal with it. That's not the hardest part. The hardest part is me disciplining myself to not say yes to everything she asks for because I delight in giving her what she asks for. Um, We have been, you know I'm a space nerd, and we're super excited for this big rocket, and we went over on Monday, and then we were supposed to go over yesterday, and I hyped my four-year-old up way too much. And so every time she was really disappointed, and so you know what yesterday then became? It became yes day. There was, the rocket said no, so dad is going to say yes. Yes, you can have ice cream. Yes, we can swim. Yes, you can have a popsicle. Yes, you can have a lollipop. Oh, you want that one? That one's really big. Okay, go ahead and finish it. Yesterday became yes day because I delight in giving my daughter what she wants. When we rely on God, we are not a burden to God. Have you ever felt like a burden to God? Have you ever felt like a burden to God? When we ask God to provide in areas where God has promised to provide, we are both, A, doing what God has called us to do and asked us to do and invited us to do, but we are also giving God the opportunity to do something God delights in doing. Twice in the series of teaching, Jesus brings up birds, and twice he says, God provides for the birds, and you know you're worth more than the birds. Now, God isn't just saying, like, monetarily speaking, if we were to cash out your life insurance policies, you're worth more than a couple of ravens. Like, we all know that. But the actual Greek word here for worth more means bearing or carrying. If your house is on... This is one of our questions from Lakeside 101. So if you're going to join us, here I'm going to preview a question for you. If your house is on fire, what are you going to carry out? Are you going to carry out the thing with the highest dollar value? Or are you going to carry out your kid? <laughs> You're going to carry out your your pet or your family heirloom. You're going to carry out the thing that means the most to you, the thing that you want to carry, the thing that you are willing to run into the fire to carry. When God says you are worth more than the ravens, he just doesn't mean like, and I'll cut a check to your family if you die. God means like, I want to carry you. You are so valued to me, valuable to me that I want to carry you. I'm in it. And then like a great teacher or stand-up comedian, Jesus starts doing some callbacks. If you ever want to get into public speaking, make a joke at the beginning and then refer to it at the end. Just callbacks work. They're great. So Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to those in need. When was the last time Jesus used the word possession? When he said, your life is not defined by possessions. And so if your life is not defined by possessions, what can you then do with your possessions? Sell them and give them away. Which, you know, he's talking to his 12 disciples who have already done that. So maybe Jesus means it literally, or maybe he means it figuratively, and maybe the answer to what it means is personal to you. But if life isn't defined by our possessions, and we don't have to hold on to them, we can use them to build the kind of relationships that neither the brother or the rich fool had. We can use our possessions to be fruitful and multiply. We can use our possessions to help other people be fruitful and multiply. And then Jesus brings back the themes from the parable of the rich fool. He says, make for yourselves wallets that don't wear out. What is a wallet? It is a a a keeping of valuable things, right? It is a container for valuables. And this treasure in heaven, what's in your wallet, will never run out. No thief comes near there. No moth destroys. When we were digging into this parable, we said he's got his, his barns are already full, and he's got all these extra grains and, and produce and all this stuff, and so what might happen if he leaves it in the open? 
It might rot. It might get stolen. It might get eaten by an animal. And Jesus is like, you know what kind of treasure you don't have to worry about that with? Heavenly treasure. Now here's the interesting thing to me. Is that when we just read that parable, Jesus seems to be saying, don't store up things for yourself. That was a foolish thing for this man to do. Uh, don't, uh, don't look for valuable keeping um, containers that are so big you never run out of room. And yet here at the end, when he's telling us what we should be doing, he's saying, make for yourself a valuable containing thing that never runs out of room, holding a treasure that never runs out. Part of the problem was this guy had more than he could ever spend in a lifetime, and now Jesus is saying, you'll, more, you'll have more than you could ever spend in eternity. Is Jesus being a hypocrite, or is he teaching us something different? What's the difference between the man's treasure and the treasure Jesus is calling us to have? Well, the location, yeah. Treasures on earth versus treasures in heaven. And in this teaching in the Gospel of Matthew, it's even more clear. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourself in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them and where thieves don't break in and steal. But it's, it's more than just a location, right? I can't jump on to wellsfargo.com and transfer a balance up to the heavenly bank, right? So it's not just the location, but what else is different? What the actual treasure is. What it is we treasure. Being rich toward God, investing in relationships, these things will last into the new kingdom. Our bank accounts won't. Caring for all creation, especially those in need, are things that fill up an account, a wallet that won't wear out and won't rot and can't be stolen. And these kinds of investments of our earthly treasures, they may and I'll even say will cost us something here and now, but it's an investment in the world to come. And it never runs out. Because it's not backed by an insurance policy that might tomorrow decide to pull out of the state of Florida. Our investment in heaven is backed by the one who delights in giving us the kingdom. Jesus closes with one final thought. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be too. And I think this is where it's all been leading. This is the key to living the life. Aligning our hearts and lives along God's calling, defining our lives by the right measure, living into our control and calling and entrusting the rest to God. Jesus says these are ways of investing in the kingdom. These are ways of, of opening ourselves up for God to give us what he wants to give us. And if your treasure, if your heart follows your treasure, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. If our investment is in heaven, then where is our heart heaven? Living the life by any other measure may satisfy us or entertain us or give us comfort for a time or a season or even, honestly, for some of us, maybe our entire earthly life. Some of us may get the chance to just enjoy being here. But if we're investing in the adulation of other people, where does that take our hearts? If we're investing in being influential on social media or going viral on social media, where does that take our hearts? If I'm investing in just seeing how many butts I can get in seats so other people look at me as a successful pastor, that might look like I'm building the kingdom, but where is it taking my heart? But if our treasure is in God's kingdom, where will our hearts go? 